Our New Testament lesson comes to us from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Now Jesus has just emerged from the waters of baptism, and as he moves with his feet still wet, the Spirit takes him to the desert to be tempted by the devil. So from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11, this is the word of the Lord. But Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him. And suddenly angels came and waited on him. A word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks. Thanks. The late Carlisle Marty was at one time a professor at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary. On one occasion, he was asked where the Garden of Eden was located. 215 Elm Street, Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> The question found that incredulous and challenged Marty with the notion that the Garden of Eden was somewhere in Asia. Marty said, you can't prove that by me because it was at 215 Elm Street that as a boy, I stole some money from my mother's purse and had gone to the store to buy candy. And when I returned, I was so ashamed I hid from the closet. It was there my mom found me, and she asked, where are you? Why are you hiding? What have you done? The Garden of Eden, the place of temptation, was for Marnie on Elm Street. Indeed, for all of us, the place of temptation is the place that so seductively attracts our attention whether by stealing money for candy, or looking for our own pleasure at the expense of others, or seeking to exalt our status and position regardless of how it affects our fellow human beings. And there we deny the wondrous gift of becoming the people that God actually created us to be. Adam and Eve, created in God's image and placed in a garden so lush that God declared this creation to be very good they were tempted to pursue a course that would lead them not to what God created them to be, but to paradise lost. They were tempted not with becoming worse, but with becoming better. After all, the serpent did not say to Adam and Eve, do you want to live like the devil? Come over here behind this tree and look at what I got. A case of booze, a deck of cards, a couple of racing magazines. We're going to have a great time wallowing in the gutter of human existence. The serpent did not say, do you want to live like the devil? The serpent said, do you want to be like God? And thus Adam and Eve, immersed in their own sense of self-importance and self-interest, were tempted with the desire to become who they were not. So it should not surprise us that since the first Adam was so easily, easily led astray, Jesus, the last Adam, as Paul would refer to him, would also seem to be a legitimate target for the tempter. 
According to Matthew, immediately after Jesus was baptized, where a voice from heaven declared him to be the beloved Son of God, Jesus was led in, by the Spirit into the wilderness where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. At that point, the tempter went to Jesus. And the tempter tried to beguile Jesus into becoming, into becoming something that he was not. On two of the three instances where the devil submitted his temptations to Jesus, the satanic one said, If you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, then you have certain privileges. You can take care of your own needs and desires first. Because you're the Son. And you can steal money from your mother's purse and buy candy. You can eat the apple. I know that you're hungry. So why don't you turn these stones into bread and get something to eat? You deserve it. And Jesus, the tempter continued, while you and I both know that you are the Son, not everyone else will know. And so you need to do something spectacular to convince the people of who you are. You do believe that you're the Son, don't you? Well, you had better prove it. If you don't, you might as well hide in the closet or crawl under a limb somewhere because you won't be acting like a chosen son. So go on, jump off the pinnacle of the temple and prove your faith in God for everyone. And Jesus, the devil added, because you are the chosen son, you must be destined for great things. Probably winning a couple of humanitarian awards in your city or receiving the Medal of Freedom from the president or maybe even getting elected as an elder or deacon in your home church. That's really impressive. But for someone like you... That's small potatoes. Look at all these kingdoms of the world. I can give you control over all that land if you bow down and worship me. You don't want to live on Elm Street all your life. You don't want to be forever confined to a garden, do you? Don't you want bigger things for yourself? As a chosen son, don't you have the right to make your own way in? Stanley Harrowhouse was at one time a professor of ethics at Duke Divinity School in North Carolina. He grew up on a farm where he and his father would herd cows together. His father was a good man, but a simple man. And because his father had been raised on the frontier, living with a gun was as natural to him as living with an automobile is for most of us. His father earned his livelihood by laying brick. And his father spent his whole, whole life working hard at honest labor. And it was unthinkable for him to do any job halfway. Stanley Harawas knew that his father loved him deeply, although it seldom meant that he would be loved verbally or physically in expression. Love meant working hard enough to give his children the opportunity to go to college so that they might have more possibilities. So Stanley went off to college and eventually made his way to Yale Divinity School. And while he was there, he became involved in a world of issues, one of which was gun control. Throughout the year, he would call home and tell his parents about the things he was learning. But his father, who was an excellent craftsman, would always respond by talking about the gun he was making. During the winter, his father had undertaken the task of forging a deer rifle. And that meant everything from boring the barrel and setting the sight to hand carving the stuff. That summer, Stanley Harawas made his usual trip home from Yale. And he had hardly entered the door when his father proudly presented him with the now completed rifle. It was a beautiful piece of craftsmanship. But Stanley Harawas was not content to stop there. Instead, flushed with theories about the importance of truthfulness and the irrationalities of our, son's gun, of our society's gun policy, he said, of course you realize that it will not be long before we, as a society, have to take these things away from you. And imagine his father's feelings as Stanley Harawas 
dropping out of you. Reflecting on that pitiful moment, <coughs> Carol Ross says, I was simply not morally mature enough to know how to respond properly when a precious gift was being given. What my father was saying, of course, was that this is a sign of how much I care for you, how much I love you. But I, his son, callously rejected, turning away from the one who loved me and nurtured me. But even though the tempter enticed Jesus, God's son, to reject his identity and focus on himself rather than on his mission, Jesus would not yield to Satan's suggestions. Jesus had a larger calling. And Jesus would not turn away from the one who called him the beloved son. Jesus, as the son of God, would share God's gifts of healing. But those miracles were never done in order to impress a crowd or to entertain a gathering or to entice people to follow him. So that he could boost his ego, affirm his own self-importance, or make things more convenient for him. Instead, they were done to illumine the world with signs of life against all forms of death. Yet during Lent, are we also aware of our fellow human beings when we make our choices? Do we discern how our wants, our desires, our conveniences affect our sisters and brothers across the globe? Do we, as children of God, look beyond ourselves in order to bring life to all people? I mean, yesterday, I returned from a board meeting in Arkansas with Solar Run the Sun. And while I was gone, I would use my cell phone to call Kathy and to see how she was doing. But recently, I have learned that in all cell phones, a rare type of metal found in the Congo in Africa is needed for those phones to work effectively. And because cell phones are in such high demand, this natural resource becomes incredibly valuable. And as a result, civil wars are now being fought in the Congo. And slaughter and human misery have escalated in order to gain control over the strategic mining areas that could bring an immense profit. And so in the Congo, many people who have probably never seen a cell phone are being killed so that I can chat at my convenience. Recently, I turned on the television and listened to a report about one of America's predominant problems. And it wasn't national security and it wasn't health care. It was obesity. And I began to wonder how we can throw away so much food, especially when most of the world goes to bed hungry every night, and still be an obese culture. During Lent, can I make better decisions about food and how it is distributed? I think I can. Because during Lent, all of us can be inspired by Christ's example to live as the disciples that God created us to be. Serving as Christ's followers whose ambitions are not confined to our own selfish desires. And who will not say they will do it because everybody else does it. And who can say no with emphasis, although the rest of the world says yes. During Lent, let us discern God's word among us and embrace our identity as God's children so that we may live as present-day disciples who cannot be bought, who will make no compromise with wrong, and who are not ashamed or afraid to stand up for the truth even when it is unpopular. During Lent, let us turn away from the distractions of the wilderness. And rather, seeking, rather than seeking only to satisfy our own hunger, let us come to the table of our Lord, where all people can share the gifts of the bread and the cup, and where we receive a foretaste of the kingdom of God. After all, isn't that a gift we all can receive? 
Isn't that a blessing we all can share? And isn't that worth making a journey through the land? Amen. As we